Hello and welcome to TSSG, that Sunday School Girl channel where you have just joined in the largest cyber community of Sunday School students. We welcome you to be able to go on to this um, site. Make sure you hit that thumbs up and like button if this is beneficial unto you. Make sure you subscribe to the channel so that you do not miss anything or any of the context. And hey, do some roaming around investigating and see how you can be a part of the connect group where we dive in deeper and build deep and more intimate relationships with one another as we prepare to present these um, lessons to you each and every week and all of it on the different platforms of Sunday School Lessons. Here today, I am going to be your instruction instructor for the international lesson. And we will be today um, looking at the gospel according to Luke, the gospel according to Luke. As we are in the international lesson series, we are taking this quarter um, in the, um, it, with the theme of examining our faith examining our faith. When I think about that phrase, examining our faith, it means it, it, it is to be inspected. It is to be, um, we are to see some things, or it ought to reveal some things when about ourselves when we examine our faith. This first unit, the first unit we spent, we was comparing saying faithful versus faithless as we looked at many of different books um, in the New Testament um, and seeing how um, people were challenged with the opportunity to either nourish their faith or neglect their faith based on the situations and circumstances they may have been experiencing. And here in this unit, in unit two, we're going to have these four lessons that's going to come from Luke and the gospel according to Matthew. And it's going to discuss a large range of Christian faith. We're going to see how our faith can be measured. You know, when I started to look at this here, it reminded me of what is called the SMART goals. You know, you got the acronym SMART, where you can, um, things that are specific, things that are measurable, things that are achievable, these th that are reliable, <clears throat> and things that, it, it, I think the, the T is timely. Um, and I might have the R wrong, but you know, you have that diagram where you'll be able to set out things to be exact, be able to examine the proficiency of something. And here we are encouraged to continue on in our faith um, by measuring out our faith. If we are going to be <clears throat> uh, you know, going through these times, we're going to need to know how to measure our faith, even in such a time as this. And our very first lesson here that is going to be presented unto us is coming from Luke chapter 5 verses 17 through 26. And we're going to hear about helping a friend in need. Let us pray. Dear heavenly and gracious Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word. We thank you, Lord, for the Institute of Sunday School, where we can really sit down and dialogue and get a better understanding of your word. We ask you, Lord, to speak, Lord, for we, your servants, are listening. Make it plain and simple, Lord, for even the five-year-old to be able to grasp. But give us some information, give us revelation that is so profound that the theologian can find some fruit in even in this. We pray all this in a mighty and matchless name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Hello to every one of you. Hello, TSSG family. Hello, TSSG family. You're in the TSSG space. Well, hello, TSSG family. Sunday, 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 Sunday you see Sunday school with that Sunday school girl. Amen, amen. So Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 26. This is our printed text for today. And as we look at this here, we just want to cover just a few things here because we see, first of all, that Luke, this gospel is called the gospel according to Luke. So that un unveils that Luke is the writer. Luke is this great physician. Luke, he is the one that was Paul's companion. Luke is someone... um um, that not only wrote the gospel according to Luke, but he also wrote the book of Acts. And we see that he names in both Luke and the gospel, I mean, the gospel of Luke and in 
ex, this guy by the name of Theophilus, who most theologians believe to be someone that has some good ranking with the Roman authority or with the Roman army. And so there we see that this is being um, specifically written to him. But in the overall aspect, we are able to see how Luke uses this gospel to be a source, to be a, a source of communication that portrays Jesus as this, um, the humanity of Jesus and this sense of him being so compassionate that you can see him being compassionate with those who are typically sit outside the margins, those who have been branded outcasts, those who have been, um, those like the Samaritans or those like women and children and tax collectors. We see a lot of these different things and how Jesus, the son, the Jesus, this humane, part, this fully human part of Jesus interacts with those that sometimes society wants to write off. But then, but then not only that, not only that, we also see Jesus being able to interact in a divine way as he is constantly doing things that only God can do. He's he's given forgiveness. He's he's healing and he's doing all sorts of different things in this gospel. And we ought to be able to realize and see some of these things as Luke renders um, his encounter of these things. And we can see when we truly look at it that he moves in such a meticulous way and in such a profound way. Even when we think about how we get into this Luke, um, into this passage in Luke. Look, at first, and when we open up the Bible and we turn to Luke chapter 5, we see that it begins off with this phrase, on this day, um, on, on one day, as NIV says, as Jesus was standing by the lake. And we hear the encounter of how he um, called Simon, who we know as Simon Peter, um, through all the things of calling and the, the fishings and, um, and the casting of the net. We see that Jesus, he has compassion. He will arrive at the place where you are and he will call you out. But then not only that, then we also are able to hear when we are experienced, when we start at about verse 12, that when Jesus was out in these towns, there came a man unto him who was um, covered in leprosy. And so we see that even with Peter, how Peter, um, Jesus went to where Peter was and, and put the calling out to him. We see this leprous man came along came to Jesus when Jesus was in the facility. And then we hear also, um, and when we enter into today's text of how some friends brought someone to Jesus. And so we see that these many are different ways that we experience all in this fifth chapter, but we're going to specifically look at for the next 20 minutes, um, what it looks like for, um, to be a, to help a friend in need. Help a friend in need. As we are going through this here, we're going to be looking at this from the NIV, also known as the New International Version. Look here, it says in verse 17, one day Jesus was teaching and the Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. The power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some came, some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the towels into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sin." Are forgiven. That, that's our first portion of the text, that friendship finds a way. We, we introduced this text and the King James and used the word, and it came to pass on a certain day. Why does he begin in that way? Well, when we just look back a couple of verses, we get to see that after dealing with the man that had leprosy, um, 
um, Luke gives some extra commentary. He says in verse 15, yet the news about him spread all the more so the so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sickness. I think that is very vital and important because when we arrive at this text, we show and we see some things that, that Luke is trying to connect here. He says, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places to, to pray. Um, and so, and I just wanted to pause right here just very, very, very briefly and just be able to say, even when ministry is increasing, when news and our popularity may be spread, when our demand is high and we get pulled in many of different ways, when people are seeing what God is able to do through us because of our faithfulness to his call and the ministry that he has entrusted us to, let us not get so busy that we do not take time to withdraw and pray. If it was valid and valuable for Jesus, then it must be valid and valuable for us as well. Let us not forsake the need of prayer. But we see as this news and was spreading that the crowds were coming. These crowds, they were coming primarily for two things. They were coming to hear him and they were coming to be healed. They was coming to hear him and they was coming to be healed. And then on this day, um, on this specific day, Jesus was teaching. And so this would have been a great opportunity for the people to come and hear. Luke um, reveals unto us who some of these people are. He says the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were sitting there. Listen, and when they had come, they had come from villages of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And it is supposed that Jesus was most likely in Capernaum. And so when we look at this, you may even want to utilize your resources with map and be able to see where Capernaum sits in, in, in proximity to these other villages like Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And we want to be able to see that. And so, so this show us what, what Luke is really trying to sh show us here in the text with this information. But notice here in the text, the people, we, we hear about the people that, will, that had came to hear. But notice that the Bible also tells us that the power was with Jesus to heal. Now, I like this part right here because it allows us to be able to know where this power comes from, this power of the Lord. It, it belongs to God and it came from God and it was with Jesus and it had a purpose. This power had a purpose and it was to heal the sick. For those who were sick, there was some healing. Maybe they had a cough. Maybe they had COVID. Maybe, maybe, maybe they, maybe they are like this man that we're going to see, this paralyzed man. Maybe they had withered hand. Maybe there was other leprosy, leprous persons around. Jesus had power in this moment that was with him to heal the sick. Maybe someone was sick with a terminal illness that looked like it was going to take, take them out. But in this place, not only was it they able to hear what Jesus was teaching, but Jesus was also had the power. He had the ability. He had all that was required and needed to heal the sick. In verse 18, we get introduced to a whole new thing. Uh, that verse 18, it says that men, some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. Look at verse 19. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. Hey, look, right here, we, we see that he, he almost like that. He puts that extra little bit of information at the end of 17. And the power of the Lord uh, was with Jesus to heal the sick. And it's just like, and now you will never guess what happened. There were some men who came carrying a paralyzed man. Hold on. These men, they weren't like the other people that was coming to hear Jesus. They weren't like other folks that was coming to be healed themselves from Jesus. They, they didn't, they might, they didn't come to try to find ways to trip up Jesus and find out what Jesus is doing wrong. They simply came because they had a concern 
for a friend. And so we hear this compassion start to bring us forth into the text. And we see it first of all being demonstrated through these friends. If we are friends, as this title says, helping a friend in need, we must have compassion for those who are close by us. Who are those that you call your friends? It reminds me of different songs. You know, back, uh, you, there's always in every generation some songs that really try to challenge us on our friendship. Songs like Lean on me. Um, it's songs that 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 says, "What about your friends? What, are they going to stand their ground, or are they going to let you down again?" Songs that say, "Friends, how many of us have some? Have them? The ones that we can depend on." There's even quotes. One of the more famous quotes is, "If you want to find friends, then first show yourself friendly." What is the compassion that you have for those that are around you? I can even hear the old golden girl song being, uh, if if this if this leopard, I mean, excuse me, if this paralyzed man could write a song and it, it would probably be to contain some of the lyrics of the Golden Girls. I know I may be a little bit almost dating myself, but it, the song just simply said, thank you for being a friend. Travel up and down the road and back again. Your heart is true. You're a friend and a confidant. And if you threw a party and invited everyone you knew, I hear you singing it with me, and then invited everyone you knew. The greatest gift would be from me to you. And the card attached would say, thank you for being a friend. And I'm just saying, when we see these type of friends, when we are these type of friends that look out and have compassion on those who we call friends, because of their circumstances and situation, we will find ourselves being friendly. Let us continue to move on. They, they, so these people, they, these four men, one of the other gospel writers that record it let us know that it's four of them. The four men, they came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat with his whole intent in mind to take him into the house and lay him before Jesus. The same Jesus that had been healing, this same Jesus that had already stretched out uh, the leprous hands. I mean, not leprous, but um, 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 um uh, lost my train of thought, my wording there. But we could see here in this fifth chapter that has already healed a leprous man. We see that they are bringing this man here because they have found out that there is something that may be there to help them. And how do we respond when we see our friends in need of something? Are we so easily and um, make it available or take those things that are available and make it accessible for our friends? Or are we trying to hoard all the extra information is so that we can just be hoarders of these things. These are not these type of friends. They came specifically and only with one thing in mind. It was to put their friend before Jesus. There are some qualities I like about these friends. First of all, that these friends, that they were able to work anonymously. There's no account of where it tells us who these people's names are. Are they they, you know, they they don't they don't they don't reveal where they have come from. It just said that these men they came carrying a paralyzed man and they had the purpose to lay him before Jesus. So then not only did they work anonymously, but they worked um they 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 worked together. The text doesn't tell us that no one was complaining about who was carrying the heaviest of the load. The text doesn't tell us that they were complaining about why the friend couldn't get up and do these things himself. And we have to be that way in the church right now. We cannot be worried about what everybody else is doing. But when we run the race that is set before us and helping out our friends, we are to be doing these things, working together and working anonymously. Um, and thirdly, thirdly, one of the other things I see that is here within this 18th and 19th verse is that these friends was dedicated to the to the task. That these friends they they were not thrown off. They were not moved to way to the side when they ran into opposition. How many of you know there will always be opposition with us when we are trying to do the things of God for those um, that we care about, for um, our loved ones? It says in verse 19, they could not find a way to do this. What does the do this? I make me wonder. The thing that they were trying to do, what is that? They were making an attempt to take him 
into the house and lay him before Jesus. But when they could not find a way, they, they was out of resources. They was out of ways of how to make this happen. When they got to that point, it was because of the crowd. And sometimes we allow the crowd's voice. We allow the crowd's present. We allow the crowd to be a distraction unto what we are to be doing. I got to move on. But we see right here in the text that they went out and they found a way. They were dedicated to the task. They worked together. They worked anonymously and they were diligent and dedicated to find a way. Even when it looked like there was no way, they went up on somebody else's roof and they towed a roof up off the place, so to speak, and lowered Jesus right in, and lowered the man right in front of Jesus. And Verse 20 shows us a part of what's going to right in and bleed right into the next portion of the lesson when Jesus saw their faith. Whose faith? Not the Pharisees and the teachers of law faith. Whose faith? Not the crowd's faith. Whose faith? Not those who had came to hear faith. Whose faith? Not those who had came to be healed faith. But when he saw their faith, whose faith? These friends' faith. That their faith was so strong that they were willing to work anonymously. That they were willing to work together. And that they was willing to work diligently and be dedicated to find a way. When he saw a faith that did not give up in the midst of opposition. He, he saw their faith and it moved him to a response. And notice what he says. He says, friend, your sins are forgiven. I said, hold up, wait a minute here. You said his friends are, the, uh, his, 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 you saw their faith, but you, you spoke and you said, your sins are forgiven. This, 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 this man is paralyzed, but you're saying that his sins are forgiven. He, 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 they brought him because he could not walk. He could not go to work. He could not provide for his family. He could not care for his mother and father. He could not care for those in the, he could not live a productive life. We came, brought him to you because we need you to help him to be able to be productive. And you said you forget your sins are forgiven. I can imagine that that would bring up some questions, but what the text tells us it's going to be very, very valid. As we prepare to get into the next portion, the greatest problem that we have is not these temporal things. We're, we're, we're quick to cry out to Jesus because our finances are not right. We're quick to cry out to Jesus because our health is not right. We call out to Jesus because things are not going right in our educational process. We'll call out to Jesus because things in the workplace ain't working right. We'll call out to Jesus because of our family issues. Our children are not acting like our children. Our spouses is not acting like they, they once used to act. We, we'll call out to Jesus in the midst of all of these different things. When we see the turmoil in our community, but we always on, we limit God to only dealing with the temporary things of this world. When Jesus shows us here that there is a greater healing that needs to take place, and that healing can only start and take place when our when our sins are forgiven. And he, Jesus proclaims that right here. And now we let us move into verse twenty one. He says, "And the scribes and the Pharisees." Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this who speaketh blasphemies? Excuse me, I was reading from King James. Let me jump down. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speak blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked. What, why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take up your mat, and go home. Immediately, he stood up in front of them and took what he had been lying on and went home praising God. Verse 26, everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. Hey, let's move briefly through this here, this friendship reward. Let's just go through and kind of comb through these texts. We're going to move a little bit quicker here in this portion. You notice here that in the midst of all the things that could have been thought, um, Luke focuses on the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. He says they begin thinking to themselves and Jesus showing that he, he trumps over what is seen 
and what is heard, he allows them to be able to realize that he knew what they were thinking. So not only did they hear that he knew what they were thinking, that meant that the crowd also heard that Jesus knew what they were thinking. And not only the crowd, but the friends is supposedly probably in still an earshot and is able to hear that these Pharisees and these teachers was thinking these things. And then not only that, the man that was laying before them also heard this as well. These Pharisees and his teachers, they have not said anything, but according to the text, this is what they were thinking in their mind. And Jesus reveals what they were thinking. Jesus has a way of revealing and knows about the deepest things that sits inside of us. Let us move on. In verse 22, Jesus knew, as he said, why are you thinking these things in your heart? In verse 23, excuse me, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk. The challenge here was, is that they began to, um, to, to, to build up. It was trying to build a case up against Jesus. And they were claiming him to be someone that was blasphemous. I mean, it would be probably the equivalent of us calling some folks hypocrites and some folks being false teachers in today's time. Some folks just act like they're Christians, but you see them on social media and they're doing all, they're doing the most. But here we see here that they are speaking blasphemy. Um, and the thing, reason why is that they, who can forgive sins but God alone? They had not recognized that Jesus had, not only did he have this power to to teach what they were hearing, but not only did he have the power to heal those who were sick, but he had power to do things that they could not understand. And sometimes we limit God and what we think are his ability is and the things that he can do. Let us move quickly on to through this here. He says, which one is easier to speak these things? I could just say your sins are forgiven, but and, and that may be easy to just say these things. Because we don't really have no physical proof or evidence of it. But which one is easier for me to say this? Or is it easier for me to tell this man to get up and walk? But he says, and he tells, but I want you to know that the son of man, this is a divine title. We've seen how compassion here is really being man out. He's tending to the man's deepest need. But now he's moving to describe himself in a divine manner. The son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. In order for you to be able to see this, I'm going to show you what I can do. This should have been more than enough proof for them because if God wasn't a part of it, God wouldn't allow it to happen. But if God is for it, then it will come forth and be, be fruitful. Here it is. He says, I tell you, Get, this is what he says to the paralyzed man. I tell you, get up, take up your mat, and go home. Verse 25, it says immediately. Oh, I love that word immediately. Especially when it's in response to something Jesus has said. These commands that demand, that Jesus gave unto the man, these were not optional commands. He didn't give them to him in a multiple choice sense. He did not give them to him as, as if it was something to be deliberated on. And when we, the saints of God, hear some instructions from God, we are to take them and move on them immediately. When we hear the commands of God, when God is doing things in our lives, we are to move immediately. Look, Look what happened. This immediately, what Jesus had said, it moved the man into obedience. We've seen the faith of the friends that brought him all the way from wherever they came, how they had to go through and how to find a way to lower him down. We see that quality of faith. We see the faith being challenged by, by these um uh, um, Pharisees and these teachers, even after they were challenged by the crowds that they couldn't get through. But we see now faith being challenged through the Pharisees and the teachers on the abilities of what Jesus can do. But then we have faith put to the test again, a faith that is measurable, a faith that receives a reward. And it's a, basically what it is saying there that this man immediately moved into full obedience. Why do I say that? Because first of all, Jesus says, he told him, he says, I tell you, not, not I'm asking you, not um, I want you to consider, not um, what you think about, but he says, I tell you, would he tell him, get up, 
What did he do? Immediately, he stood up in front of them. He didn't wait till he got to a place where he was more comfortable. He didn't get all shy and timid and say, well, not, not right now in front of all these people. What if I fail? What if I, what if I, what if I fall down when I get up? He didn't, he wasn't concerned about any of those things. Jesus said, get up. And the man stood up in front of them. Second of all, Jesus told him to take up your mat. And look what it says in verse 25. He says, he took what he had been lying on. That was that mat. He took it. Just as Jesus had said, he was not concerned about it being too heavy for him because he hadn't been used to carrying things around. He hadn't been worried about what folks were saying about him. He wasn't concerned about what day of the week it was. He just took it up his mat just as Jesus had instructed him. The third the third thing that Jesus tells unto him is to go home. And what the Bible tells us in verse 25, and he went home. And so he see that he moved in complete obedience. But then not only that, check out the manner or how he goes home. While he has done all these things in front of everybody, he went home. He didn't go home praising his friends, and, and they are worthy of some thanksgiving themselves, but he went home praising God because it was God that was instituting. It was God that was setting that up all along. It was God that he was praising. And then not only that, as we get to the end of this study here today, verse 26, Notice that our obedience, that this man's obedience has a way to wow some other folks in our lives. Why do I say that? Because in verse 26, everyone. So now he says everyone. So I have reason to believe that this everyone includes the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the, the crowd that was there to be healed, the crowd that was there to hear everybody, the four friends that carried him on the mat. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. God. Notice that this man was not concerned about everyone else, but what he did, he did because God had told him to do it, or specifically because Jesus had told him to do it. And when he moved and when he did this, it left everyone astonished at the great things that had happened. And in their astonishment, they began to praise God. Oh man, they had a praise session. One, it was, it was contagious. It was spreading. It was, it was, it was like a match that was lit and in the midst of a of a dry dry place, and that match that was lit started fire on a leaf. The leaf started fire on the grass. The grass started fire up on trees. The trees started fire up on other trees, and the whole forest goes up in a flame. But here, this is exactly about how we see this praise of what God had done. That. Everyone was amazed and began to praise God for what they were doing. And here we get the glimpse of be able to see what the part of their praise was or why they were um, 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 praising. As they were filled with awe, they was, they was, oh my goodness, they was blown out their mind of what they had seen. The Bible says we have seen remarkable things today. We have seen things that just really don't make no sense. We have seen some strange things today. We have seen some things that really just blows our mind. Hey, I'm, 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 I'm past my time. I'm way overdue, but I just want you to be able to ask you this one question here today. What type of friend have you been? What, what type of friend are you? Are you the type of friend that others can depend on? Are you the type of friends that is going to fail and let your, um, let your friends fall? Are you just a friend that goes to church and get everything that you can get for yourself and then turn up your nose at your friends? Or are you these type of friends that is presented here in the text? Friends that will work together, friends that will work anonymously, friends that will work through difficulty to get um, their friends to the presence of God so that they can receive the ultimate healer. Hey, but you know what? The greatest hero in this text is not these four friends. The greatest hero is Jesus. And Jesus shows us in this text and I believe this is one of the main things that Luke wants to show in this text. He shows us three things or three truths that we can learn and live by when we're concerned with Jesus. That Jesus, the things that Jesus did, he did as the power of the Lord was upon him. It said here in the text that when he was healing, that when he was teaching, that the power of the Lord was on him to heal. So we see that he is under a divine assignment. And then not only that, we, we see that Jesus has power to forgive sins. Not only did he have power to heal 
physically, but he had power to forgive sins. God, that, that, that is so powerful for us because without our sins being forgiven, there is no way that we can have an active relationship with God. So it's good to be able to know that through Jesus, we have the forgiveness of our sins. And then not only that, we also see that Jesus has the ability to search out the heart of man. He shows us this in a text as he reads their minds and reveals to them what had been said. But then not only that, but that Jesus has the authority and the authority of his commands. And as we see what he tells unto the paralyzed man. And then when we see what Jesus is doing in our lives, when we see the things that is going on and taking place, that when we see God moves, that God deserves the glory. God deserves the glory. God deserves the glory. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Sunday school lesson. We give you glory today. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus, our hero, who is compassionate enough to care about those who are lonely, who are hurt, those who are in need, those who are not only in the church, but that sit outside of the church. Oh, what a friend we have in Jesus carrying all of our sins and grief to bear. Lord, we want to take this moment to acknowledge this friendship and the reality that Jesus called this man friend. And Lord, we want Jesus to call us friend as well. Help us, Lord, to find ways to apply this to our lives as we go throughout our next few days, weeks, and months. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And may God bless you and may God keep you. That is my humble prayer. Thank you so much for sharing in this space with us today. If this ministry has blessed you in any way, I invite you to consider sharing a small gift of just $3 with us. You can do so by scanning one of the QR codes on the screen. And please don't forget, we are waiting for you to join us over in the TSSG Connect. You can see all the benefits here on the screen and we look forward to serving you in a more personal way. Have you had an opportunity to visit our amazing swag shop? Stop by and check out great items for Sunday school and church school. T-shirts, pouches, mugs, and so much more. Find something that you'll enjoy or something for your favorite teacher. Sunday school with that Sunday